Uh, I love cryptography, but I'm just, I'm not an expert at it. So there's a fundamental problem. All of these discussions of cryptography start with fictional characters, Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate privately. Eve is an eavesdropper, and Eve wants to know what Alice and Bob are saying to each other. And of course, Alice and Bob want to keep that private. So a little bit of terminology. Uh, what Alice and Bob want to communicate is what we call plain text. That's either text, images, voice, video. The ciphertext is what goes back and forth between them, what Eve is able to overhear. And the key is what lets you transform plain text into ciphertext or vice versa. And generally, when we talk about any of these, we talk about them in the length of bits, like a 56-bit key, 64-bit block of plain text, et cetera. So depending on what Alice and Bob are communicating, they might use different types of ciphers. A stream cipher would encrypt a bit or a byte at a time, suitable for real-time data like voice or video. And a block cipher encrypts a fixed size block of data, something when you've got data of a known length, like text, images, recorded video. A uh, stream cipher is a single bit or byte at a time. You have a key that initializes a key string generator that creates a series of data that looks pseudo random. And then you combine that with the plain text to get the ciphertext, or you combine it with the ciphertext to get the plain text. It's a reversible operation. Uh, there's lots of different ways to generate the key stream for a stream cipher. Uh, one of them is a series of random letters. Uh, it's called a one-time pad, and it's theoretically unbreakable, but it has to be truly random and you never reuse it. That's why they call it one time. And so like here in this example, let me switch to the pointer. So you'd use this L to index here. And if your letter was A, the encrypted version would be O. But then a couple letters later, this H index is over here and then A encrypts to a different letter. Uh, One-time pads are kind of difficult to use and uh, difficult to generate perfectly. So people use other things that are more pseudo-random. A linear feedback shift register, it's very easy to implement, especially in hardware. RC4 was a very popular cipher. It's simple and fast, and it was used in the WEP security model for 802.11 wireless networks. Uh, the Enigma machine is probably one of the most famous stream ciphers. Germany used that during World War II, and this is key stream generation and the encryption and decryption in the same machine. The key setup is how the rotors and the blood board are initially set up. And then there's wiring in those rotors. So wiring that they press the A key and the G key or the G lamp here lights up. Then the next time they press it, these rotors have advanced and a different letter lights up. So that's great. Uh, but what we really want to know is how you break those ciphers. If you know the uh, plain text and you know the cipher text, then you can recover the key stream. And once you have the key stream, you can use that to decrypt anything else that was encrypted with the same key stream. So part of what enabled the allies to break Enigma was key reuse. There were daily and weekly keys. And the other part is just guessing. They, they could get the cipher text because that went over, uh, you know, over radio links that they could eavesdrop on. And then they could start guessing at the plain text. So they didn't have a space bar on the machine. Notice that's missing. They would use the X key as a space. And so when they were sending a message to someone, it would start with A and X. In German, on means two. So they started out on Oberleutnant Schmidt, and it would start out with A and X. If it was a long message, they'd start it with Fort, which is Fort Setzung for continuation. And then starting from that point, they could start to work out the key stream. Uh, linear feedback shift registers are insecure against a type of attack called a correlation attack. And then in 2001, three researchers found a weakness in RC4's key scheduling algorithm, and they also found some bias in the outputs, and that made it possible to recover that web key after sniffing a large number of wireless network packets. So we're back to an unbreakable one-time path. Um, and this is actually... I took the name of the candidate that I voted for and I encrypted it with this one-time pad. These are in the order that they appeared on my ballot. It turns out that if you encrypt it here, you get Trump. If you use this, you get Biden. 
either one is statistically equally likely. And so from cryptanalysis, you can't tell what I wrote and I'm not gonna tell you anyway, so. So there's stream ciphers. Uh, block ciphers, you take an input, you break it up into fixed size blocks, 64, 128, 256 bits. You pad out the last block of data and it runs through this function that gives you plain text to ciphertext or vice versa. Um, DES, the data encryption standard, was a very popular block cipher from 1970s up to the end of the century. And it uses this structure, it's called a Feistel network. It's a very popular construction in block ciphers. It has the very nice property that encryption and decryption are the same operations. You just have different values coming in here as keys. And so when you're implementing all of this in uh, electronic hardware, you don't need as much hardware for that because you only have to have the one block function there instead of one bit of hardware for encrypting and another for decrypting. Um, this structure, this happens, you know, anywhere from eight to 64 rounds. And this function in the middle is uh, some expansion and some substitution and permutations in here. Now, there's a, a funny story about the history of DES that uh, IBM worked with the NSA during the development, and this was in the 70s. And they had some values in these S boxes for substituting um, for a reversible substitution. And the NSA suggested some changes in those values, and IBM went along with it. And then in 1990, there was a technique discovered, it was published. There was a publication of differential cryptanalysis. And it turned out that uh, before the NSA's changes, uh, DES wasn't very resistant to this type of attack. And after the, NE, uh, the NSA made these changes to DES, it was much more resistant to the attack. So somebody else knew about it a lot earlier. But DES was still starting to show weaknesses uh, in the 90s. Brute force cracking machines were built on custom hardware. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation built one for under $250,000 which for a government is, that's chump change if they want to, uh, to snoop on everybody's communications. So in 1997, NIST started a computation. They were evaluating 15 different designs submitted by the cryptographic community. And they settled on one, it was called Rheindahl, and it was uh, renamed uh, the Advanced Encryption Standard. It uses a substitution permutation network. And this is just the very high level there's uh, some substitution of bytes, shifting things around, permuting them, doing some multiplication, uh, and adding round keys in there. And that gets repeated 10, 12, 14 times, depending on key length. So we have a block cipher. Oops, sorry, headphones there. Now that we have a block cipher, how do we use it? Uh, the simplest method is called electronic code book. So you take your plain text, you break it up into blocks, you encrypt it. You can do this in parallel if you have a lot of hardware. And then you get ciphertext. And then you can decrypt it the same way in any order. But it has a significant vulnerability. So the same input encrypts to the same output and you can spot patterns in ciphertext. So here's the Chrome logo as a graphic. If you encrypt that with electronic codebook encryption, this is the image you get. And it's not perfect, but you can kind of tell what's going on in the image. So patterns in the, in the ciphertext can be detected there. So then there's different modes of operation um, using chaining, using uh, an initialization vector, which is really just another random number that the two of you agree on along with the key, combining a key with a nonce and then a counter so that you can do these encryptions and decryptions independently for like random access, uh, uh, like random sectors on a disk. But with chaining or feedback, uh, the same plain text does not encrypt to the same ciphertext. And so now that pattern that we saw earlier has just been replaced with a random noise here. You can't make out any patterns. So stream ciphers, block ciphers, we need a key. And until we're using an encrypted channel, everything that we say to each other can be seen by Eve as well. So we need to agree on a key, but Eve can see everything. So we say, hey, I'm gonna use this key. And Eve's like, that's awesome. I love that, I've got your key. 
Sometimes Alice and Bob can meet in person, but what if they can't because physical distance, uh, because they're relatively an anonymous to each other, or because they live in an oppressive governmental regime where they just simply can't meet? So stream of block ciphers, you have this key, the identical key that encrypts and decrypts, but we can also classify ciphers by the type, the relationships between the encryption and decryption keys. Uh, everything that I've shown so far is a symmetric cipher, same key, encrypts and decrypts. An asymmetric cipher has different encryption and decryption keys that are mathematically related. Uh, they use functions that are very easy to compute one way, but very difficult to go the other way. And I like to, to offer the example of multiplication for grade school kids. So ask a kid to multiply, you know, ask them what's 11 times 13? And they can figure that out, but then say, hey, I need you to find two numbers that multiply together to equal 143. And they're gonna spend a lot longer figuring that out. Now, asymmetric encryption relies on the lot longer being measured in decades, centuries, millennia, or the heat death of the universe. And uh, also when we talk about being significantly slower, we're talking about a thousand times slower for comparable security levels. So why would we do that? Why would we do something a thousand times slower? Um, I took this screenshot of the Intercepts web page before Glenn Greenwald resigned. So now it's a, a little bit of history, but uh, asymmetric encryption, we also call it public key encryption because one of those two keys can be public knowledge. And I can encrypt data to communicate with someone else without having to exchange a key in person or have an already trusted channel. As long as I trust that uh, this public key offered on this website is actually legitimate, I can send encrypted data to Glenn Greenwald without exchanging secret keys beforehand. So there are two popular public key crypto systems that, that I wanna talk about. Uh, RSA uses modular exponentiation with very large numbers that are thousands of bits long. And there, the um, modulus here is the product of two prime numbers. And it relies on the difficulty of factoring this huge number and computing discrete logarithms. So finding this exponent where A raised to a power is equivalent to B modulo N. And that's a, that's a very hard problem to do. Um, I believe it's the subject of, of one of those uh, Millennium Prizes, uh, the million dollar prize, something like that. Um, honestly, breaking that would be worth more than a million dollars if you had criminal intentions. But it's, it's considered a very hard problem. There's no good answer to it. Uh, the other popular crypto system is elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, it uses curves of this form and an operation called dot or add. Uh, you take a line between two points and it intersects at one other point and on that curve, and then you reflect it across the x-axis and then you repeat again. So this would, you do P dot Q to get R right here. And then you do P dot that and find the intersection, which would be right about there. And it would come across to there. So the number of times, if all you have is the starting and the ending point, it's infeasible to determine how many times that has actually been dotted. So to grossly oversimplify it, we agree on a particular curve. I pick a point and a random number. I dot the point that many times. And the number of times that I dotted it is, is the private part. The starting and ending point is the public part. Uh, you have to have a very good source of random numbers to pick that private key. Other than that, um, once you solve that problem, it's it's a pretty secure system. Nobody's figured out how to do it. Uh, and again, it's, it's a discrete logarithm problem in an elliptic field instead of uh, the integer field. But it, mathematicians don't know how to solve it short of brute force, trying every possible combination.
So we then use public key encryption. We share a secret key over an insecure channel. Recovering my secret key, you have to have the private key if you're the recipient or you have to break public key encryption. Um, but if you can get the private key, maybe you've got malware on my machine or I've got bad operational security, then you can decrypt every message that I've ever sent uh, that's ever been encrypted with that private key. And that includes if you've intercepted a whole bunch of data off the internet and saved it in a huge data center. So we need, we need more help. We're gonna introduce Mallory here. Mallory is, is another one of these uh, fictitious characters. Mallory's a malicious actor and wants to get between Alice and Bob. Mallory accepts that she can't break RSA or elliptic curve. So instead Mallory intercepts and changes their communication about the key. Mallory's got her own public and private key. She sends her public key to Bob and Bob encrypts a message back to Alice, but using Mallory's key thinking that he's sending it to Alice. Mallory decrypts, re-encrypts, sends it back to, to Alice. And so they think that they're talking to each other. Um, Alice says, hey, transfer the money to my account number. And Mallory sticks her own account number in there. And Bob's like, okay, I did it. So we need a way to verify those public keys. And we can do that with a cryptographic hash that can help us. Uh, we take an arbitrarily large input. We do a lot of simple math on it to create a smaller fixed size number. So, you know, anywhere from 128 to 256, 512 bits of hash. And of course, there's only, you know, two to the that many power, two to the n possible hash values, an infinite number of possible input files. But there's uh, good cryptographic hash functions have these properties that we call pre-image resistance, second pre-image resistance, and collision resistance. So you've got the hash, but you can't find the message that makes that hash, or you can't find two that are equivalent. Uh, there's an example here of, this is the SHA-1 hash function. Small changes in the input cause large changes in the output. You can see here if the V gets changed to a U, we get a very different output. If two letters are transposed, if a letter is deleted, it's a small change in the input causes a significant change in the output. Um, this is the basic computation at the heart of SHA-256, which is a, uh, a more modern hash function than SHA-1. And you run through this 64 times uh, so these are all 32-bit words, 256 bits cross. It gets repeated. There's a whole bunch of combinations here. And by the time you're done, it's essentially that every single output bit depends on every input bit and not in the same way. And some of you are probably like, well, Bitcoin uses SHA-256 and you find a value that hashes out to, to meet that. And uh, yes, that is true, but it's actually not doing the reverse hash computation. There's really only 32 bits in the input that change. And so you try all two to the 32nd power um, possible combinations to find an output that meets the criteria there to mine the Bitcoin. So you're not actually running the hash computation backwards. You're just like, well, if I tweak you know, these 32 bits, can I get an output that matches up? It's a trial and error thing. So then back to... Uh, Back to Glenn Greenwald, uh, this downloading the public key here gives you a four, well, it did gave, <laughs> yeah, um, it gave you a 4,096-bit public key. There's a much shorter hash of it here that's called the fingerprint. And so I can take the public key, I can fingerprint it, I can compute the hash and see, yes, it wasn't modified in transit. Once I've got all of these uh, different primitives available, the cryptographic hash and the asymmetric encryption, now I can do digital signatures. Uh, in 25 words or less, and this is actually 25 words, I counted, uh, but you take the hash of the message, you encrypt it with your private key, and then publish that. And then anybody that has your public key, because it can be public knowledge, can verify. And really what they're verifying there is that uh, only my private key could have created something 
that decrypts correctly with my public key. And that's, it's kind of turning the, the crypto on its head. Normally you want to encrypt something, only the recipient can read it. In this case, you want everybody to be able to read it, but they want to be able to verify that it came from you. And so by decrypting that encrypted hash with your public key, they can say, they can have a, a pretty good degree of confidence that that did actually come from you. And that concludes my, uh, my basic introduction to cryptography. I hope that it's been uh, useful and interesting to you. As I said at the start, it won't make you a crypto expert, but uh, when people are talking about uh, cryptography, uh, you can actually say, oh, yeah, I understand some of those words. And I believe we have a Slido. Uh, oh, we don't have any questions. I have supplemental material then. Do, do, do. Um, we're going to add a new attacker here who is Greg, good guy Greg, the government. And good guy Greg insists on being able to listen in to the converse, all the conversations between every Alice and every Bob uh, in the name of uh, stopping crime, catching criminals, et cetera. Um, and you know, they, Greg is like, well, you know, I'll only listen in with proper legal authorization. So the encryption has to use a key from Greg in some way to allow Greg to decrypt that without Alice's or Bob's permission. And that all sounds great. We're all in favor of, of catching bad guys and, uh, and preventing uh, terrorist attacks and, and whatever, other, um, whatever other reasons are put forward for that. But if we're using a key from Greg to encrypt these things so that Greg can decrypt it, what happens when Greg's keys leak? Um, or what happens when good guy Greg turns into scumbag Steve? Scumbag Steve is an oppressive oh. government where dissidents are arrested, imprisoned, even tortured and executed. So we want good guy Greg to listen in, but we disallow scumbag Steve. Both of them are eavesdropping, and it's really only their intentions that make us want to allow one or and disallow the other. But here's the problem. It looks the same. They're both eavesdroppers and an algorithm can't tell the difference between the two of them. All that the algorithm can see is someone other than Alice and Bob wants to get their hands on the plain text. The algorithm can't know their intentions and it can't apply our moral judgment to those intentions. So this is one of those uh, very difficult problems that in, in theory, you know, cryptography could solve. We can encrypt with a separate key um, that somebody else holds and they're able to decrypt and, and get access to that conversation. But the crypto system itself, the math doesn't care and, and doesn't know about their intentions or what we think about their intentions, whether, whether we think that's a good thing or a bad thing for them to be able to listen in. So that's one of those uh, problems that, that exist outside of, of the nice pure math and science field here that is cryptography. And that is my supplemental material. Let me see. Where'd my other window go? There it is. Okay. Well, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, I hope it was helpful and interesting to you.